Today, we are continuing on our sermon series on missional living. This is part three, and I've titled uh, my sermon, The Beauty of the Gospel. So before we go into the Word of God, uh, let us pr- say the prayer for illumination together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your Word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So before we uh, look and read the Scripture, I'll just give you a, a very simple, uh, like a sermon map. Uh, so there are three parts to my sermon. They are not equally proportioned, so don't worry if the first part is taking a bit longer. The first part, we will look at the text itself, Romans 10, verses 13 to 15. We want to look at the context. We want to look at what the author is saying, uh, the original meaning, the intention of the text uh, by the author, the Apostle Paul. And then we want to, to ask, so what does the text have to do with missional living? And the last part will be the implications, the implications for all of us who call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. So the very first part, uh, I'm not able to give us like an overview of the whole book of Romans, but I want to zoom in on chapters uh, 9 to 11. I think this will be good enough to give us uh, the context for the particular text that we're looking at this morning. So in Romans 9 uh, to 11, the Apostle Paul is addressing the unbelief of Israel. So you must have this in mind in order to understand the text. Paul is addressing the unbelief of Israel. And for those of you who are new to the Bible, uh, in the context of, of you know, the Christian faith, Israel is a nation, a people called and set apart by God to represent God to the nations and to bring the nations back to Him. I will talk about this more in a short while. So Paul uses these three chapters to cover what happened to Israel and what is happening to Israel and what will happen to Israel. And I like how a great Bible commentator, John Stock, uh, outlines uh, in his commentary. And he, he writes, Romans 9 is really about the fall of Israel. Romans 10, the fall of Israel. And Romans 11, the future of Israel. So this morning, we'll be looking at Romans 10. And the main issue, again, that Paul is addressing is the problem of Israel unbelief, which leads to the question, has the word of God failed? Didn't God say to Israel through the Old Testament prophecy that God will put His law within their hearts and that God will be their God and they shall be God's people. Didn't Paul himself say at the start of the letter to the church in Rome that the gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe, the Jews first and then the Gentiles? So has the word of God failed? According to Paul, the unbelief of Israel was not the fault of God, and it was not the failure of God's word. Rather, it was a failure of the Israelites to receive the word of God into their hearts. Simply put, the Israelites had yet to enter into the promise of God's salvation because they were stubborn. So how did Paul arrive at this conclusion? He started by using four questions to explain what must happen before someone receives the salvation of God into his or her life. And he did this not so much to give a lesson on evangelism, but to make the point that everything has been put in place for Israel to be safe so that they are without excuses. And with that, uh, we shall look at our scripture text for today. So, 
uh, I want to encourage you, even though the scriptures will be on the screen, that we'll turn uh, to our Bibles. Romans 10, beginning with verse 13. And Paul writes, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what must happen before someone is saved? And Paul puts it simply through the four questions. Five things must happen. First, sending of the preacher or messenger. Second, preaching the gospel of Christ. Third, hearing the gospel of Christ. And fourth, believing in Christ. And lastly, calling on Christ. Uh, here, just allow me to sidetrack a bit to, to talk about what's the difference between believing in Christ and calling on Christ. Here again, I want to, to share from what uh, John Stock uh, wrote in his book, Basic Christianity. We may concede that the evidence for the deity of Jesus is compelling, even conclusive, and that He was in fact the Son of God. We may believe that He came and died to be the Saviour of the world, we may also admit that we are sinners and need such a saviour. But none of these things makes us Christians, nor do all of them together. To believe certain facts about the person and work of Christ is a necessary preliminary. But true faith will translate such mental belief into a decisive act of trust. Intellectual conviction must lead to personal commitment. I thought it's important for us to, to really understand this part uh, because we must know that it is not enough for us just to know about Christ. Uh, we must personally put our faith in Him to call on Jesus and say, Jesus, I put my life into your hands. I want to live for you and you alone. Yeah, so through all these questions, Paul is basically trying to, to explain that everything has been in place for Israel to experience the salvation of God. And in verse 17, Paul again emphasizes the importance for the preaching of the gospel so that people can hear the gospel and come to faith. He writes, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So back to the question, why then have the Israelites not believed? Has the word of God failed? In Romans 10, as we continue to read on, verses 18 to 20, Paul explains that it is not because the Israelites have not heard the gospel, neither is it because they have not understand the gospel. And the reason is simply this, Again, as John Stott puts it, Israel is simply stubborn. You know, I hope by now we are clear why Paul writes what he writes in Romans 10, 13 to 15. But we must not miss out on something very extremely important in all of these arguments made by Paul. And that can be found in verse 21. But of Israel, God says, All day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people, or in another translation, to a disobedient and obstinate people. You know, our God is a God who holds out his hands even to those who are disobedient, even to those who are turning their backs against God, so that they 
can run to Christ and to receive the gift of salvation. And such is the beauty of the gospel. Or again, as Paul puts it earlier in the letter, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I often repeat this verse to my children because I want them to remember that God came for us even before we were looking for Him. God loves us even before we say, God, I love you. It is so important for us to know that we have a God who holds out His hands to us all the time, even when we are turning our backs against Him. You know, I like how Pastor Timothy Keller puts it. To be loved but not known is superficial. To be known but not loved is our nightmare. Only Jesus knows us to the bottom and loves us to the sky. That is who Jesus is to all of us. Even if you are seated here or you are watching online and Jesus is still someone who is a stranger to you, I want you to know that Jesus knows all of us true and true. And yet, He loves us so much that He's willing to die on the cross for us. Think about it. How many of us will say that if someone really knows us true and true, will still love us to the sky? But we have one who does that. Jesus. You know, I, I shared this uh, with my kids uh, last night. I just was practicing for the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure whether they are the best audience. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, I spoke to Tim and said that, wow, I can never write something like this. But then he said that he can. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, just to make it a bit lighthearted because you realize that today's sermon may be a bit intense. But I want us not to overlook this very important fact that our Lord Jesus, despite how stubborn we can be, He never fails to hold out His hands to us. This is the beauty of the gospel. So, what does all this have to do with missional living? You know, while our scripture text is not a lesson on evangelism or missions, as it is to address the unbelief of Israel, it communicates the critical need for all of God's people to share the beauty of the gospel to all the people in the world who have yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to emphasize the word all. All. All of us are involved to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to all the people in the world. You know, a person or anyone cannot hear the gospel and come to faith in Jesus unless someone or some people take the gospel to him or her. And that is why Paul said, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And this is also why Jesus said to his disciples these very important words just before he ascended to heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. Uh, Pastor Daniel uh, last weekend has preached on this quite extensively. So if you have not heard the sermon, I want to encourage you to go to our church YouTube channel and you can find all our sermons there. So let me zoom up a bit and consider the Bible as a whole and not just 
what Romans 10 is saying. If we zoom up and look at the whole Bible as a whole, the Bible tells a unified story of God's mission to save all people and all creation from the corruption of sin through the people of God. So if you look and you read through the whole Bible, this is that one story of God, a story of God's love, a story of God's grace, who said, even when we turn our backs against Him, God is not done with us. And God is going to save us from the corruption of sin through the very people of God, beginning, beginning with Abraham and his family, which eventually became the nation Israel. But we all know, or for some of us, when we read the Bible in the Old Testament, we know that Israel has failed to live up to that, to be a light to the nations. But the story didn't end with the failure of Israel. The story continued and reached its climax in the life, in the person, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus not only did what Israel failed to do, Jesus gathered and commissioned His disciples to continue His mission. We read that uh, in the Great Commission in the Gospels. Jesus commissioned all His disciples, including all of us here, who confess Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. We are all commissioned to continue the mission of Christ. And so as disciples of Christ, we are all part of this amazing story of God. We are all called to participate in the mission of Christ. And what is this mission? Simply put, to be a light to the nations. It has never changed from the beginning of the Bible to the end. We are called to be a light to the nations. You know, in the very first sermon, Pastor B uh, shared from uh, the video uh, trader and he quoted this, where you live does not make you a missionary. The mission you are on makes you a missionary. And the mission is clear for all of us to let the light of Christ shine through us wherever we are or wherever God is calling us to be. You know, there are still many, many, many people in the world who have yet to hear the gospel of Christ. And I'm not talking about far away countries, even in Singapore and our neighboring countries in Southeast Asia and in Asia. There are many people who have yet to hear the gospel of Christ. And you may not realize it, there are many people in the Asian countries who may not personally know a Christian. And that's why Paul said, Paul wrote, how then were they called on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So here, Paul was quoting from Isaiah 52, verse 7, when he said, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so in the context of Isaiah, these words describe someone appearing on the mountains to announce the good news that God has delivered Israel from the enemies. Or perhaps another imagery that will help us to relate to this text is that of a familiar story of the Greek messenger who ran all the way from the battlefields of Marathon to Athens to announce the Greek victory over the Persians. You know, to these ancient people who were oppressed or attacked by another nation or empire, the announcement of victory that we have won, can you imagine the joy that it brought to the people? Can you imagine that they were all waiting and to find out whether they have won the fight against the enemies. And when a person arrives and announces, we have won, 
it is such good news. You know, the good news that Paul mentioned in Romans 10, 15 is far more glorious than any good news that we have in the world because it has to do with the victory over the worst enemy facing humanity, the enemy of sin. You know, because of sin, which affects everyone in the world, because of sin, our relationships are broken. We are not able to love God. We are not able to love one another. I don't know about you, many of us struggle to love one another. And especially, we struggle to love those who we find it hard to get along with. But you know, when God created us, it was meant for all of us to love one another perfectly. And not only are we not able to love God or love one another, we are not able even to love ourselves the way God has designed us to love ourselves. And we can see that in the many struggles that we face as we struggle with low self-esteem, we struggle with some of the mental stress and depression and things like this. And not only that, we also struggle to love the world that we are living in. God created us to steward everything that He has given to us. But instead of taking care of God's creation, we end up destroying it. But Jesus came. Jesus came to save us from sin. And so when we believe in Jesus and call on the name of Jesus, we are no longer slaves to sin. That is the good news. You know, friends, it means a lot that we are no longer slaves to sin. Sin is not master over us when we call on the name of Jesus. We were once lost, but now we are found. We were once blind, but now we can see. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And even earlier, as uh, Rupert and the team leads us in the time of worship, I believe we are, we are again experiencing the good news of Jesus, that Christ is always there for us, holding on to us. Even when we are going through the worst of the valleys, Christ is there with us. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, someone or some people have preached the gospel to us. We have heard the gospel. We have believed the gospel. We have called on the name of Jesus. The question that we need to ask ourselves is this, and this is the last part of my sermon, what are we going to do with this good news? Will we say to the Lord, here I am, send me to preach the good news. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat. But a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. And without thinking for themselves, they went out day and night, searching for the lost. And some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to be associated with the station and give their time, money, and effort to support the work. New boats were bought and new crews trained. The little life-saving station grew. And some of these new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so run down and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those who were saved from the sea. And so they replaced the emergency courts with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. And now the Life Saving Station became a popular social gathering place for its members. And they decorated it beautifully and furnished it, 
so well because they use it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions. And so, they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. And about this time, the, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of coal, wet and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick and some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos. And so the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. And at the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. A small number of members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But a small group of members were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And they did. And as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club. And yet, another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself. And if you kind of visit this seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in the waters, but most of the people drown without anyone going out to save them. You know, I heard this story uh, many, many, many years ago when I, when I was a, a young Christian. And it really uh, helped me to understand the purpose of the church. Why we exist. And I can tell you that no Christians would disagree that we are meant to be a life-saving station. But can I say this to you, that even to myself, that many times the Lord has to use this story to remind me why we exist. For many of us who are in church for a long time, including myself as a pastor, sometimes we can get so caught up with ourselves that we kind of forget why we exist in the first place. I'm not saying this, that we are like this in CMC, but I want to, to challenge us to go deeper and ask ourselves, how are we fulfilling God's purpose to all of us here in CMC? And the danger is this, this whole shift from a life saving station to a club can be very subtle. You may not even realize it, but if you are, if you are, you are able to observe and think about it more carefully, you just have to look at the way we talk, the way we do church. Sometimes it feels like it is only for those people who are already in the church, but not for those outside the church. Then we have to ask ourselves, why do we exist in the first place? A theologian put it this way, the church, believing that all the benefits of Christ were just for them, has betrayed the purpose for which God has given them. It is as though the postman were to imagine that all the letters in his bag were intended for him. You know, God has blessed us richly and God wants to bless us, but it's never meant to stay within the four walls of the church. It's never meant to stay within our lives. God wants us to share the benefits of Christ with those who have yet to hear the gospel. Recently at the Antioch Summit, organized by Antioch 21, the missions arm of Love Singapore, 
it gathered more than 800 people, including pastors, missionaries, and believers from over 100 churches and 20 mission agencies for the sake of the Great Commission. And something that the organizer, uh, Joseph Chen, shared, which he also shared at our church camp, he said this, at the turn of the millennium, referring to 1990 to 2000, Singapore was ranked by Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary as the number one missionary sending nation in the world. Some two decades later, the number of missionaries we have been sending out today has dropped by half. And not only that, the missionaries that were sent out in the past, many of them are retiring. But not many new missionaries have come on board to continue the mission of Christ. And at the Antioch Summit, the decade of missions was launched. And the goal is to raise a missionary force of all generations within the next decade to be launched into gateway cities, least rich places to reach the lost, the unrich, and the unengaged in Asia and beyond. And there are some faith goals that, uh, through much prayer, uh, they are put together. First, to mobilize 80% evangelical churches to engage in missions, to place 1,000 Singapore missionaries and 300 migrant missionaries into the nations, a minimum of two years, to plant 500 new churches to adopt and actively engage 50 unreached people groups, to pioneer 100 holistic mission initiatives, and lastly, to raise 10 million for the work of missions as a seed fund for smaller churches and post few support. Now, I'm sharing all this because I, I really feel that the decade of missions is not just another nationwide campaign, you know, trying to get the church to do something together. I believe it is the heart of God for the nations. And God is calling Singapore to be part of this work that he's doing, that in the next decade, God is doing, going to, to do a great thing for the nations. And he wants Singapore to be part of it. You know, all of these targets is not meant so that in 10 years' time, we can say, oh, you know, we are the number one missionary sending church. You know, Singapore is so great. No, it is not that. This faith goes is so that we are committed to the mission of God. This faith goes, even though we, we should not be chasing after numbers, but the numbers do reflect the spiritual condition of the churches in Singapore, including CMC. Maybe some of us think that as a church, we are not doing so bad. In fact, we are actually really passionate about God because we have so many Bible study classes going on and our worship services are so vibrant. And I don't disagree. I think we are passionate for God and I think we are loving our community. But I believe that God wants us to go even deeper, further, and greater, as Pastor Edwin has shared this vision with the church. And so I want to challenge us to ask an even deeper question. You know, are we seeking more of God for the sake of ourselves? Or are we seeking more of God for the sake of of the world, for the sake of the many who have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what does it mean for us to live missionally? There are two things I want to bring to, to share with us, two applications. One, we need to keep our hearts burning with the beauty of the gospel. Again, I, I really believe that, you know, every time when we gather on a Sunday to worship, we have a glimpse of the beauty of the gospel. But more than that, 
if we think about how God has reached out to us and saved us, we know the beauty of the gospel. But my question to all of us is, have we lost the sense of wonder of the cross? Have we taken the grace of God for granted? But are we still captivated by what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and what God is still doing for us and in us in Jesus Christ? Are we captivated by the love and grace of God? And I hope that we are. Because when we are captivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will then go forth and to share the gospel with others. And practically, that means that we need to make time for others so that through our lives, our words and our actions, more people can come to know and experience the beauty of the gospel. So you know by now, when I talk about living missionary, it doesn't mean that we must go to another country to live cross-culturally. Some of us will be called to do that. And I pray that, you know, we will obey the Lord's call. But for many of us here, it is our workplace, it is our schools, it is the cap that you're taking, the hairdresser that you meet, the many people that you come across in your neighbourhood, including those who clean up the area for you. Do we make time for others so that through our lives, our words and our actions, that they will experience the grace and the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. But again, all of these things that we are called to do may seem like, oh, so difficult. But that's why uh, Pastor Edwin and the leadership of the church continues to encourage us to go deeper in the four essentials. We cannot do this by our own efforts alone. But when we go deeper into the four essentials, when we grow in a sense of yielding to the Lord, when we continue to grow in our adoration of God, in our consecration unto the Lord, and in our obedience to the Lord, God will use us to bring His gospel to many. So let me close with this. The gospel is the most beautiful message in the world. And this is the part where you say, Amen. <laughs> the gospel is the most beautiful message in the world. Amen. Amen. And that's why Paul says in Romans 10, 15, you and I are beautiful. In fact, you and I are the most beautiful people in the world when we go forth and preach this beautiful message of God to our lives, our words, and our actions. You know, we are always chasing after beautiful things in our lives. Some of us, we get to experience the beauty of success. Some of us, we get to experience the beauty of wealth, the beauty of relationships, or the beauty of looks. For the last one, I've given up long ago. <laughs> but we know that all of these beautiful things will not last. In fact, a preacher put it this way, what you think is beautiful now is going to be a thing of the past in just a few years. Those you think are beautiful now will no longer be beautiful in physical terms but the beauty of the bearers of the gospel will last forever. Don't you want to be the most beautiful people in the world? But more importantly, don't you want to be the most beautiful people in the sight of God? And it is very clear to us that you are beautiful when you carry the beautiful message of the gospel in our Jerusalem, in our Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You know, talking about this, and I will really, really close with this. 
You know, since my short time of joining CMC, I've got to know many beautiful people in this church. And by now, I know, I hope you know, I don't mean your physical look. Of course, many of you here look really good. You have great fashion taste. <laughs> but honestly, I have met so many beautiful people in our church. When you're out there in Marine Terrace, when you're out there in Thailand, when you're out there in Cambodia, and of course, our missionaries who came back in China and other parts of the world and in Singapore. You know, so many of you are so beautiful in your worship to the Lord because you didn't keep the gospel to yourself and you didn't ask, what else, God, can you do for me? But you ask, what else, God, can you do through me? I'm so inspired by many of you who wants to, so, to do so much more for the people who have yet to hear the gospel. And I believe and I pray that the time has come that God will pour out His Spirit upon us. That the fire that God has already started in our church, the many pockets of fire, it will not just keep burning, but it will spread. It will really spread even beyond our imagination. But it begins with us saying, God, here I am. Send me. We may not know exactly what we need to do or how we can do it, but with God, all things are possible. So can I invite all of us to stand? Uh, just want to lead us in a time of prayer and then the worship team will lead us in a song of response. Lord, you are beautiful. Thank you so much for helping us to come back to you and to know that, Lord, you are beautiful. You are all that we need in our lives. Lord, I pray for all of us here in CMC that we will not just behold your beauty and keep it to ourselves. But let us go forth to shine forth your beauty to the rest of the world. Lord, when you called us to join you in your mission to save the world, you didn't call us to do it on our own strength, but you promised us your Holy Spirit. You promised us your Holy Spirit. You promise to pour out your Spirit upon all your people so that we can be your witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Lord, we are here to say, come and pour out your Spirit upon us. Come and pour out your oil upon the fire that you have lighted in our hearts so that this fire will grow stronger and this fire will spread to more and more people and that the whole world will come to see the light of Christ in us in CMC. So Lord, come. Come and fill us with the Holy Ghost. Come and fill us with your love. Come and fill us with your goodness that there will be such an overflowing of your presence in your church that when people come into contact with CMC, they come into contact with you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.